One, the old information transmitted by Paul implies the empty tomb. It does so in two ways. First, the expression, he was raised, following the expression, he was buried, implies an empty grave. A first century Jew could not have thought otherwise. Second, the expression, on the third day, is probably a reference to the day of the women's discovery of the empty tomb. Thus, we have two extremely early indications of the fact of the empty tomb. Number two, the empty tomb story is also part of Mark's very old source material. Mark's source didn't end with Jesus' burial, but with the empty tomb narrative, which is tied to the burial account verbally and grammatically. And thus, we have very early independent attestation of the fact of the empty tomb. Three, the story is simple and lacks signs of legendary embellishment. In Mark's account, the women come to the tomb early Sunday morning and find the stone rolled away and the tomb empty. They see an angelic figure who proclaims to them that Jesus is risen and will appear to them in Galilee. Then they flee from the tomb in terror and silence. Now, to appreciate the simplicity of this account, one has only to compare it to the accounts in the forged apocryphal Gospels of the second century and beyond. They're colored by all sorts of apologetical and theological motifs, which are conspicuously missing from the stark account in Mark. Four, the tomb was probably discovered empty by women. In Jewish society, the testimony of women was regarded as so unreliable that according to Josephus, they were not even permitted to serve as witnesses in a Jewish court of law. Now, in light of this fact, how remarkable it is that it is women who are the discoverers of Jesus' empty tomb. Any later legendary account would certainly have made male disciples like Peter and John discover the empty tomb. But the gospel writers faithfully record what, for them, was an awkward and embarrassing fact. Five, the earliest Jewish response presupposes the empty tomb. What were Jews saying in response to the disciples' proclamation, he is risen from the dead? That these men were drunk? That the body still lay in the tomb in the garden? No, they said the disciples came and stole away his body. Matthew 28, 13. Now think about that for a second. The disciples came and stole away his body. The earliest Jewish response to the proclamation of the resurrection was itself an attempt to explain why the body was missing. Thus we have evidence for the empty tomb from the very enemies of the early Christian movement. I could go on. But I think enough has been said to indicate why, in the words of Jakob Kramer, an Austrian specialist on the resurrection, by far most scholars hold firmly to the reliability of the biblical statements concerning the empty tomb. Fact number three. On multiple occasions and under various circumstances, different individuals and groups of people experienced appearances of Jesus alive from the dead. This is a fact which is universally acknowledged among New Testament scholars for the following reasons. One, the list of eyewitnesses to Jesus' resurrection appearances, which is quoted by Paul, guarantees that such appearances occurred. The old formula quoted by Paul goes on to say, then he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Given the early date of this information, as well as Paul's personal acquaintance with the people involved, such appearances cannot be dismissed as legendary, but must refer to actual events. Two, the appearance narratives in the Gospels provide multiple independent attestation of the appearances. For example, the appearance to Peter is attested by Luke and Paul. The appearance to the Twelve is attested by Luke, John, and Paul. The appearance to the women is attested by Matthew and John. And appearances in Galilee are attested by Mark, Matthew, and John. The appearance narratives span such a breadth of independent sources 
that it cannot be reasonably denied that the earliest disciples did have such experiences. Even the skeptical critic, Gert Ludemann, therefore concludes, it may be taken as historically certain that Peter and the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ. Finally, fact number four. The original disciples suddenly and sincerely came to believe that Jesus was risen from the dead despite their having every predisposition to the contrary. Think of the situation the disciples faced following Jesus' crucifixion. Number one, their leader was dead. And Jews had no belief in a dying, much less rising, Messiah. Two, according to Jewish law, Jesus' execution as a criminal exposed him as a heretic, a man literally accursed by God. Three, Jewish beliefs about the afterlife precluded anyone's rising from the dead to glory and immortality before the general resurrection at the end of the world. Nevertheless, the original disciples suddenly came to believe so strongly that God had raised Jesus from the dead that they were willing to die for the truth of that belief. Luke Johnson of Emory University states, some sort of powerful, transformative experience is required to generate the sort of movement earliest Christianity was. And N.T. Wright, an eminent British scholar, concludes, that is why, as a historian, I cannot explain the rise of early Christianity unless Jesus rose again, leaving an empty tomb behind him. In summary, there are four facts agreed upon by the majority of scholars who have written on this subject. Jesus' burial by Joseph of Arimathea, his empty tomb, his post-mortem appearances, and the origin of the disciples' belief. And thus, the majority of scholars would agree with my first contention. But that leads to my second basic contention, that the best explanation of these facts is that God raised Jesus from the dead. In his book, Justifying Historical Descriptions, historian C.B. McCullough lists six tests which historians use in determining what is the best explanation for given historical facts. The hypothesis, God raised Jesus from the dead, passes all these tests. Number one, it has great explanatory scope. It explains why the tomb was found empty why the disciples saw post-mortem appearances of Jesus, and why the Christian faith came into being. Two, it has great explanatory power. It explains why the body of Jesus was missing, why people repeatedly saw Jesus alive, despite his earlier public execution, and so forth. Three, it is plausible. Given the historical context of Jesus' own unparalleled life and claims to be God's Son, and the unique revelation of God to mankind, the resurrection serves as divine confirmation of those radical claims. Four, it is not ad hoc or contrived. It requires only one additional hypothesis, that God exists. And even that need not be an additional hypothesis if you already believe in God's existence. Five, it is in accord with accepted beliefs. The hypothesis, God raised Jesus from the dead, does not in any way conflict with the accepted belief that people don't rise naturally from the dead. The Christian accepts that belief as wholeheartedly as he accepts the hypothesis that God raised Jesus from the dead. And six, it far outstrips any of its rival theories in meeting conditions one to five. Down through history, various alternative explanations of the facts have been offered. For example, the conspiracy theory, the apparent death theory, the hallucination theory, and so forth. Such hypotheses have been almost universally rejected by contemporary scholarship. No naturalistic hypothesis has attracted a great number of scholars. In conclusion, then, given these four facts, which are accepted by the majority of scholars today, as well as the failure of all naturalistic hypotheses, I think we're justified in inferring that the best explanation of the facts is the one given by the eyewitnesses themselves. God raised Jesus from the dead. If Dr. Avalos is to show that Jesus' resurrection is a mere fiction, then he must not only refute the evidence for the resurrection, but he must also give evidence that the resurrection narratives of the New Testament are, in fact, false. In the meantime, 
The rational man can hardly be blamed, I think, if he believes that on that first Easter morning a divine miracle occurred.